You are listening to The Centropic Oracle, an audiobook podcast of science fiction and fantasy short stories that make you think and feel. Weight of the World by Jose Pablo Iriate We weren't going to Earth to bury my boy. We weren't. And yet as we drew closer, kilometer by infinitesimal kilometer, The old liturgy ran through my thoughts like a tuneless song. Earth to earth, ashes to ashes, dust to dust. The Steinman Protocol that offered the only hope for Jason's condition was only available back on Earth. That's the reason the three of us had packed up and taken a shuttle to Bester Station, the Hook's counterweight, and why we were now trying to settle in for the eight-day trip down the home planet's gravity well. In the tiny stateroom, I held a pile of folded clothes, waiting for Annette to stow some shirts so there'd be space for me to maneuver in front of the netting of the closet. Behind me, Jason bounced like a subatomic particle, glorying in the reduced gravity and the freedom to move. Show me where New York is, Daddy. I turned to see him dangling in front of the portal, pressing his face to the glass to get a view of Earth below us. When I found a home for the clothes, I stepped over and peered through, our faces pressed together, his heavy breathing leaving a light mist on the surface in front of us. Any other lunar boy would not have been winded from a few minutes' exertion in this microgravity, but for now, that was the only sign of the war raging inside him. From this angle, I barely saw the planet at all, and most of what I could make out was ocean, the Americas forming a green sliver along the upper right border. The once familiar northeast all but disappeared beneath the haze of the planet's atmosphere. You see that part sticking out there? That's Florida. If you keep following the coast up about twice as far, that's where New York is. He'd already taken off, though, before the words left my mouth. Having caught his breath, he whooped as he savored the sensation of flying. Mommy, look! From the next stateroom, a pounding on the wall made the whole room shake. I winced. Settle down, Jason! There weren't very many families taking the hook down to the surface. We were probably some executive's worst nightmare. He's only eight, Annette said. You're not getting him to keep quiet for a whole week, Mark. She turned out to be wrong, though. As the days passed, first gravity returned, and then, bit by bit, it grew beyond anything he'd ever experienced. He became weaker almost by the hour, as the distance to the Hook's base in Ecuador shrank. And a premonition struck. This was what it would be like at the end. The treatments would fail, and we'd watch him struggle, until even breathing became impossible, and we'd bury my boy on this alien, to him, world. After the flight from Quakewell to New York, Annette opted for a powered diamag scooter, like most lunar tourists. We got a wheelchair for Jason that was more like an oversized baby stroller. I waved off the terracist representative. I would walk. Annette stared at me. Mark, are you sure? I shrugged. I spent my first 25 years on this planet, and I've put my time in at the gym. I think I can manage to walk around for a few weeks. Jason's treatments were spread out over a couple dozen visits to Sloan Kettering. First they had to sequence his DNA and sample the cancer, and then generate custom vaccines to teach his dendritic cells to target the bad cells. Trip after trip to be poked, scanned, and otherwise tortured, and it might not even amount to anything. In between the hospital visits, we showed Jason all the haunts of my childhood we'd never expected to share with him. The brownstone where I grew up, my old school, Yankee Stadium, the old sites that remained, those that had not been paved over for some new megascraper, all looked more dilapidated than in my memories. I began to associate Earth with brokenness. Everything was falling apart here. Even my boy. Even us. I felt weak as an old man, staggering from place to place, resting often, getting up only reluctantly. My grunts and discomforts were lost on Jason, though. He stared up at me from his stroller as if I were demonstrating ungodly power, like a superhero. We Blackwoods are born strong, I said, when I caught him gawking. Not me. Yes, you. You most of all. You're strong on the inside. You're fighting off all those bad cells, one by one, and you're doing an awesome job. He smiled. At night, I hurt so much I could hardly sleep. 
but I kept it out of my face during the day. Gradually, the treatments ran their course. There was no way to tell until the end if they were having the desired effect or not. Jason continued to weaken, but we'd been told to expect that. After a week, we had to put him back in diapers. I'm really a baby now, he said, tears in his eyes. What? Oh, no, Jason, you're... No, sweetheart, Annette cut in, rescuing me. You're smart and funny, and you know so many things that a baby doesn't. And besides, I added weakly, this is only for a little while, until you get better. Annette hugged him, glaring at me over the top of his head. If he gets better, her eyes seemed to say. The thing was, taking care of him now did remind me of when he was a baby, relying on Annette and me for everything. I hate myself for it, but part of me was glad for it. Jason wasn't a clingy boy, and part of me reveled in having him back in my arms and feeling needed again. The doctors assured us his weakness was to be expected. His body was learning to fight this thing, and the fight was taking its toll. We could only hope he was up to the battle. The night before his last hospital visit, where we'd find out if he was going to get better or not, we visited the top of the Empire State Building. From his stroller, he couldn't make out anything but the sky and the mega scrapers that surrounded us. I picked him up, grabbing onto the metalwork to brace against both the wind and the weight, and biting my lip to keep from groaning. I couldn't tell where the trembling of the building ended and the shaking of my legs began. Jason clutched me like when he was a toddler, and I pointed out the Hudson River and where Central Park used to be. He looked out attentively, but the heights, the crowds, and the swaying became too much for him. Panicked, he asked to be returned to his stroller. I obliged quickly, relieved to be putting him down. Later, as we were tucking him in, he clutched Annette's hand. I'm scared, he said. I'm scared too, sweetheart, she replied. You're going to be fine, I said. Remember, we're born strong, we don't go down easy. Later, over Jason's soft snores, Annette asked, What if he's not fine? What if the treatment doesn't work? and he spends his last days thinking he's let you down. I said nothing. Once Annette had gone to bed too, I went out on the balcony and stared at the city that used to be our home. When Jason had first been diagnosed and the doctors told us our options, I'd had all the answers. Of course we would mortgage our futures to come to Earth. Of course we would fight this thing instead of making Jason's remaining months comfortable. Of course he would get better. If anybody had other ideas, I didn't hear them. Now, watching Jason suffer, listening to Annette's doubts, I realized it was I who had grown weaker since our trip down planet. I used to know exactly what needed to be done, and now I knew nothing. Had I made things worse for my boy? Who could say? The thought was just another weight to bear. The next day I put my hand on his head as they prepared to glide his gurney away from us. I'm going to beat this, he said. I'm tough, like you. Annette caught my eye. That's right, I choked out. You are. The minutes crawled. But when they finally ushered us in to talk to the lead doctor and her assistants, I wanted to stop the clock altogether. Not knowing was better. I struggled to understand her at first. The words slipped off my brain as though they were oiled. Finally, their meaning fell into place. Jason was going to make it. Somebody grabbed me, and only then did I realize I'd begun to fall. I let them ease me into a chair. My boy would recover. I could stop pretending to be strong. We hope you enjoyed Weight of the World by Jose Pablo Iriarte, read by C.B. Drogi. If you'd like to make a donation to the author and narrator of this story, check out the story page link in the description and click the PayPal donate button, or pledge your support to us directly on Patreon. Would you like to submit a story to the Centropic Oracle? A link to our submission guidelines can be found in the description.